of Jesus, the Nazarene. And I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean, singing how marvelous, how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me for me it was the garden he prayed not my will but thine he had no tears for his own griefs but sweat drops of blood for mine singing how marvelous how wonderful shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me he took my sin my sorrows he made them his very own he bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone singing how marvelous how wonderful shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me singing how shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me Rock of ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself from thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flow be our sin, the double cure. Save from a wrath that may. My tears ever flow. Could my zeal no longer know? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and now alone. In my hand, no prize I bring. Simply to well, I draw this fleeting breath when my eyes shall close in death, when 
Hey everybody, I need your help. Here at Copperay Community Church, we're doing something a little different this year. November 1st, the day after Halloween, is a day on the church calendar called All Saints Day. It's a day where we honor those who've come before us. The problem is, is that when most of us hear the word saint, we think of that in the Christian history kind of way, of these legends, these heroes of the faith that well, most of us will never live up to. But the truth is, in the Bible, the word saint is used to describe, well, anyone who follows Jesus that's a part of the church. And so what we want to do this year is honor those everyday saints, the people in our lives that have passed on but had a huge impact on us, that made our world better or the world around us better. Maybe that was the grandma whose faith was what held the family together. Maybe that was a teacher who went above and beyond, who stayed after class, who invested in your life. Maybe it was a coach or a coworker. Maybe, I don't know, 
but you do. And that's what we want to capture. We want to know who your saints are. And so you'll see a link in the notes to this video that you can click and you go and we just want you to share a picture in a simple paragraph telling us about your saint. And we're going to put those together in a digital gallery and then display them around the church on All Saints Day. Because those saints, those everyday saints, those are the ones that we want to honor. Because they're the ones, well, changing lives with Jesus' love. So help us out. Tell us about your saint. Thank you. Hi, Caught Prairie. I am leading you in communion from Shell Knob, Missouri, where Laura and Eli and I have had a almost a full week of vacation here. It's been really nice. Now, what I'm realizing is that when you have some time away, you start to look at the rest of your life with fresh eyes. We've had time as a family uh, to go do things together, always safely masked. Um, Laura and I had a wonderful date day in Eureka Springs and a nice steak dinner. And, you know, you just see your family, your spouse, your life with fresh eyes. And it's these fresh eyes that I'm thinking about today. You know, Pastor Chris is finishing our series, The Monsters We Become. He's finishing the series with the story of the prodigal son. And for whatever other monsters were, the prodigal son was dealing with, he needed to get away before he came to his senses. Now, to be fair, the prodigal son and the McKnights, we did different things during our times away. But both of us know as we come back to the Father's house, we're coming back to a Father who, who loves us more than we deserve, who we can trust to welcome us almost in a foolishly generous way. We can trust that that Father of ours is going to run interference with our critics, that he's going to try to reconcile us to the people who are angry. He's going to try to make sure that we have a fresh start in life. This happens week after week when we come to the Father's house or now in COVID time when we invite the worship of Jesus into our house. So I'm just glad to be with you today. I was grateful to God for this beautiful time that I had with my family and my beautiful wife. And I'm grateful, like the prodigal son, to be coming home. Not to an empty spirit, an empty place, but to a house that's full of the Lord's grace. And I hope that's how you feel too, as you sit around in your house, your car, your driveway, with your family, by yourself, with your friends, and celebrate this communion together. Because that father of ours who wrapped his arms around the prodigal wayward son returning home after, after a time away, a change of scenery, comes back to a fresh start with a reinvigorated family in which he's no longer lost but found, where he's no longer dead but alive again. You see, on the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he started to teach his disciples that because they needed to trust that for the long haul. He was going to die and he needed them to know that out of death can come life and that this generous father that was rescuing the prodigal son would rescue him too. You see, on that night, our Lord Jesus took bread from the table or wheat thins, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them to eat and said, this is my body, it's broken for you. I want you to do this for the remembrance of me. And in the same, same way after supper, he took the cup, in this case, a little bit of Chardonnay, and he lifted it, he gave thanks to God, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin and the newness of life. I want you to do this for the remembrance of me. And then they would have prayed that prayer that our Lord Jesus had taught them to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is the body of Christ, broken for you, and the blood of Christ, shed for you. As you take and 
eat and drink this, I want you to finally also remember that next Sunday is All Saints Sunday. It is the Sunday we had scheduled to return to the building, although this and last week we were inside the worship space instead of out on the lawn. We are returning permanently for the season um, inside to the building next week. And it is All Saints Sunday, when, or Your Saints Sunday, as we've renamed it. And I encourage you to go to copperyorg backslash saints and tell us the story of a saint in your life who changed your life with Jesus' love. Welcome to worship. I'll be online with you today, kind of quarantining after the whole vacation trip. And I wish us a wonderful Sabbath in the Lord's house together today.
Good morning, Cop Prairie. This is Pastor Chris, and I am here to share with you today's message. We are finishing up our series today entitled, The Monsters We Become. The idea behind this series was, well, Halloween is coming up. And actually, let me just pause for a second and give you an opportunity to go ahead and get involved in this message. If you plan on dressing up for Halloween, I don't care what age you are, if you plan on dressing up for Halloween, go ahead and just post in the chat what you're planning on being, because I, I, I have to know. I think that's a part of us being a community, is for me to know what you are going to dress up as. So go ahead and just put that in the chat now. But the idea behind this series was to look at the monsters that we often associate with Halloween and ask how can we become like those monsters in our life or in our spiritual life if we're not careful. Week one, we took a look at vampires, people who suck the life out of us. Week two, we took a look at ghosts, people who are stuck in the past. Last week, we took a look at werewolves, people who transform into something else. But this week, this week we're talking about zombies. And more than any other monster over the last decade and a half, zombies have risen in popularity. They are all over. Whether we're talking about movies like I Am Legend or 28 Days Later, books like World War Z or TV shows like The Walking Dead, even Disney got in on it. There are two musical movies entitled Zombies, and I know that because I've watched them more than you, more than anyone should. I can sing along with the soundtrack. I'm the father of a nine-year-old. Zombies are everywhere, so much so that I can play this, and you, in your mind, just hearing that small bit, were most likely imagining a bunch of zombies dancing together in a parking lot. Now, originally for this message, we were going to have Pastor Dan do the thriller dance for you guys on camera, but there was a scheduling conflict and we couldn't make it happen. But, once again, in the chat, I'm going to put something up. Just click. If you would like to see Dan dance the thriller dance on camera, uh, go ahead and just click that now. I think it's important for him to know that the demand is out there. But that, that thriller music video, that scene where the zombies begin to come out of the ground and then eventually dance, is actually based on a movie. The 1968 film, Night of the Living dead. And that's the phrase we're going to take a look at this morning. The living dead. And I see, I think this message is relevant. Because see, I think that some of us are living, but we aren't living. Some of us aren't thriving. We're barely surviving. Some of us are going through life with very little life, especially in 2020. Many of us feel like we are walking around like zombies or like the living dead. It reminds me of a quote that's often attributed to Benjamin Franklin. He said, some men die at the age of 25 but aren't buried until the age of 75. Or as another writer said it, Many men die a good many years before the undertaker carts them away. I think a lot of us can relate to that. We've gone through life just, well, going through life. Some of us are there right now, and some of us have been there before. I think this is something that we can all relate to. 
we've all had times where we would probably describe our life as living dead. Where getting out of bed in the morning was much like crawling out of a grave. The drive, the passion, the desire just wasn't there. So today we're going to take a look at that, what causes that, and what we can do about it. Now I think there are two causes that I want to talk about. We're going to spend most of our time focused on the second one, but I think it's important that we talk about the first one. See, if you're going through life and you're experiencing a, a numbness, a living deadness, sometimes that can be the symptom of depression or anxiety or bipolar disorder or another mental illness. I once had somebody tell me that depression isn't feeling down. Depression is just not feeling. And I, I get that. I've been there before. I've experienced that in my own life. So sometimes when you feel like a zombie, it very well could be the symptom of a mental illness. And to those of you who are connecting with what I'm saying right now, I have two things that I want to say. Number one is that is not a sin. It is not a sin to be depressed or anxious. That's important because there are some churches out there that believe it is, that believe that you're experiencing those things because of something you've done or not done in relation to God. But I don't believe that to be the case. Scientists are discovering that oftentimes mental illness is caused by neurons that aren't firing correctly in the brain or chemicals in the body that are out of balance. And that is nothing that you should feel shame or guilt about. It is not a sin. And number two, it is okay to seek help. In fact, if you're seeking help, I have more respect for you than I did before I knew that. Because it shows that you want to better yourself. See, if mental illness is something that's going on in our body that's not right, well, think about it like this. If my leg was not doing what my leg was supposed to do, I would go to a physical therapist to learn how to control my leg. So if my mind is not doing what my mind is supposed to do, I'm going to go to a mental therapist to learn how to control my mind. And my mind is far more advanced than my leg. So it makes sense that I would want somebody to teach me how to better use my brain. If you ever hear somebody out there that says, I'm never going to need a therapist, I'm never going to need a counselor, you know what they sound like to me? They sound like that person that's sitting in front of their computer and they say, I don't know how to use this and I never want to learn how to use it. And those people drive me crazy because they're the ones that are always calling me asking for tech help like I'm the geek squad or something. Sorry. Um, that I lost it a little bit there. But what, what I mean by that is that our brains are complex. And at some point in life, we're all going to need help knowing how to use them. And I also want to say that if you go to a doctor and your doctor decides that part of the treatment that you need is taking medication, that is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing about that that should cause you to feel shame or guilt. In fact, every morning I wake up, walk into the kitchen, take two Flintstone vitamins, don't judge me, and then I take a 300 milligram Wellbutrin XL. I have for many years and it helps keep me balanced and it helps me be who God created me to be. And that's a good thing. So I, This is something I'm really passionate about. Just a couple weeks ago we celebrated Mental Health Day. And, and if you're watching this, I want you to know that our church, my dream for our church is that it is a place where we can discuss mental illness and promote mental health. That's the kind of congregation that you're going to find at Cal Community Church. It's very dear to my heart. 
So the number one cause that I often see for this numbness or this living deadness, it's related to mental illness. But the second cause that I often see is related to spiritual illness. It's when something in our, our relationship with God isn't right and it's causing us to not, well, live. You see, Jesus in John 12, there's this beautiful verse where he tells his followers that I have come to give you life and life to the full. Or as another translation says, life more abundant. Or as the New Living Translation says, a rich and satisfying life. That's what Jesus wants for us. But a lot of us, that's not what we're experiencing. We're experiencing the numbness, the living deadness. Our spiritual lives are more like a zombie just wandering through each day without a sense of purpose. It reminds me of what one American poet said. She wrote, I don't want to get to the end of my life and find that I have just lived the length of it. I want to have lived the width of it as well. I believe that's what God wants us to do. God wants us to not only live the length of life, but the width of life, the depth of life, the 3D, the fullness, the abundance of life. That is what God desires for us. But a lot of times our spiritual lives are in a place that well, there's more deadness and it doesn't allow us to experience that. Now throughout this series, one of the things that Pastor Dan and I have done is we've looked for parables, the stories that Jesus tells. And we've asked, are there parables that show people becoming the monsters that we're talking about? And we think we found some or at least some creative interpretations of some parables that let us see that monster in them. Now the one I want to look at today is, well, it's the parable to end all parables. You know, if I was to ask what's the most famous verse in the Bible, many would say John 3.16. If I was to ask what's the most famous chapter in the Bible, many would say Psalm 23. But if I was asked what's the most famous story in the Bible, many people would point to this story right here. One commentary writer, William Barclay, says that this story is the gospel inside the gospel. That if we want to see God's heart in the purest form, we find it in this story. It's the story found in Luke 15. The story that many of us call the parable of the prodigal son. Now I know, some of you are thinking, I've heard that before, I've heard sermons on that before, I've heard you or Dan preach sermons on that before, so I'm just going to zone out now. But please don't. If you ever get to a point in your faith where you don't need to hear this story again, your faith is in a really bad spot. We can't hear this story enough. It is so full of of the gospel, the good news, that I think we need, to, we need to read this story more. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take one more look at this story, the parable of the prodigal son. Now, the story starts out. It says, a man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. Now, those words had to hurt. You guys know I'm a father. I have a nine-year-old daughter. And over the past year, I've watched her mature and immature a lot. I've watched her get sassy at times. And she's never said anything super hurtful. She's been great. But every once in a while, just like any kid, she'll say something that hurts. And as a parent, there's nothing harder than that. So I can't imagine what this father feels when his child comes to him and says, basically, I wish, I wish you were dead. 
I want my inheritance right now. I, I want you out of my life. I wish you were already gone. That had to be crushing. And yet the father, he agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. And he sends them off. It says a few days later, the younger son packed up all his belongings and moved to a distant land. It says there he wasted all his money on wild living. It says about the time his money ran out, there was a great famine sweep over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him. And the man sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. It says the young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. Here's a young man who was experiencing life with his father, but he decided to walk away from that. And before long, he's, he's broke. He's homeless and hungry. He's barely surviving. Now, the story doesn't tell us a lot about what he was feeling in that moment. But I'm guessing it was a lot of shame and a lot of guilt. I'm guessing he felt dead inside and it sounds like even outside. I'm guessing that waking up in the morning often felt like crawling out of a grave. I think many of us find ourselves there. We've walked away from what God has for us Intentionally or unintentionally, but that's where we find ourselves. And we find ourselves dead, like a zombie. And culturally, you have to understand that Jewish people, they, they believe the law tells them not to eat pig. That's why we have kosher food. Much less raise pigs, much less feed pigs. So culturally, he's at the lowest point that he can find. The traditions, the beliefs that he grew up with, they are dead to him in this moment. He is as much of a zombie as we're going to find. But then, in a moment, as he is living dead, it says he finally came to his senses. And he said to himself at home, even the hired servants have enough food to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. He said, I'll go home to my father. And I'll say I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But take me on as a hired servant. And he begins that journey home. And it's towards the end of that journey that we find what I would call one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. It says here in Luke 15, verse 20, And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. He embraced him and kissed him. Now, I love that little detail at the beginning. While he was still a long way off. Because that implies that the father was watching. And maybe it's my overactive imagination, but I can see in my head the father sitting on the porch at night after all the work is done, just looking over the horizon to see if today is going to be the day that his boy comes home. And I can see his wife coming out on the porch and saying, Babe, why don't you come in and get a snack? We can watch some Netflix and go to bed. And, and he says, Nah, just a few more minutes. I don't want to miss it. If today is the day my boy comes home. And then it was that day. He sees him. And when he does, it says he takes off running. Now, in their culture, a man of his stature, most likely wearing a robe, to take off running was undignified. Yet he doesn't care because his child is coming home. 
There's also another cool little detail behind the story. There was a Jewish custom, a ceremony, when somebody would leave their community and go live with the Gentiles and squander their wealth and then come back. Many times the men of the village would go to the edge of the community to meet that individual coming back and they would take a, a bowl or a jar and as they tried to enter back into the community, they would drop it and it would shatter on the ground and they would say, this brokenness represents the relationship that we used to have. That you're no longer welcome here. You're dead to us. No wonder the Father is running because He wants to beat those individuals to the edge of the community. He wants everybody. There would have no doubt been a crowd following Him to see what all the commotion was about. And He wants every one of them to know that His Son is welcomed back. That's why He embraces Him. That's why He hugs Him. That's why He kisses Him and He takes Him in because He wants everyone to know my child's home. And then he says they throw a party. It's a celebration. It's a celebration that actually ends with some really powerful words. It says here in verse 32, we, we had to celebrate this happy day. For your brother was dead and he's come back to life. He was lost but now is found. This morning... I, I did a funeral for a couple that is near and dear to my heart. Their daughter passed away this last week. She was 29 and beautiful inside and out. In fact, she was a beauty consultant as a job. And, and I remarked this morning that that seemed more true than just as a job. She brought beauty to everyone around her. But she battled addiction. And she passed away this past week. But I talked this morning about how I truly believe because Jesus was her Lord, her Savior, that the moment she took a step towards heaven, her heavenly father got off the throne and sprinted to meet her at the gates where he wrapped his arms around her because his child had come home. I find so much hope in that. A hope that transcends death. But here's, here's the beauty of it. We don't have to wait until we die to experience that. Scripture tells us that even when we feel like a zombie, the moment we take a step towards God, we begin to walk towards God, He sprints to embrace us. He was watching for us because He wants us to experience life and life to the full, life more abundant, a rich and satisfying life. That's what He has for us. And we can experience that here and now on this side of death and on the other. That's the beauty of it. If we're living for God now, we're not the living dead after we die, we're the dead living. We get to continue the celebration even after our earthly life ends. And so that, that is how we, we stop being zombies. Like it said, that's how the dead become living again. Is that we begin to walk towards God. We say that we're going to live our life for God. And that's what I want you to do. That's what I want this whole church to do. Maybe this sounds a little old school. Maybe this sounds a little Baptist-like, but I want you to come to Jesus. I want you to begin to walk towards your Heavenly Father. I want us to be the kind of people that wake up every day and pray knowing that we need God's help. I want us to take time each week to open up this book 
You know that passage where Jesus says he wants them to have life and a rich and satisfying life? Well, in the middle of that, he's explaining to them that he is the shepherd and they are the sheep and good sheep know the shepherd's voice. And if we want to experience what the shepherd has for us, then we need to know his voice. And I believe that we find his voice in Scripture. I believe that when we begin to meet with other Christians, whether that's in person or online, that's when we begin to, to join the celebration that God has for us. Now that's not to say that it's always going to be easy. The Christian life is full of ups and downs. There are still going to be mountains and valleys. But the beauty of it is that when we are alive, not just alive, but alive in Christ, we don't have to do it alone. He walks with us. Our Heavenly Father walks with us. And if your Heavenly Father is walking with you, if Christ is walking with you, if you are full of the Holy Spirit, then you're not the living dead. You're the living. Let's pray. Dear God, I pray that each and every one of us can begin to walk towards you. Maybe even this morning experience your embrace, your love. I pray that those of us who have felt numb in life, a living deadness, that we can begin to step away from the life of a zombie and towards the life of a Christian that we can be filled with you and your life this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today.
children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May His presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around. you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you amen 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 Good morning, cop.
amount of diary teeming around. Here I raise my Ebenezer, here by thy great help I come, and I hope I thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus saw me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Seal it, seal it for thy courts above. 